example, when you have paid Russian trolls and Russian security services influence operations in the West, it seems. Unfortunately, I had to find that out myself. It was really when I go back to that time, this was in 2016, 2017, uh, I remember I was living in constant fear, in constant uh, having to look uh, over my shoulder, having to read, even on my free time, around the clock, this filth just pouring in from every channel. And the police was also giving me instructions that I should start to look after my surroundings. I should start to look after if there's any suspicious activities around my own apartment, uh, if there is some suspicious suspicious things under my car, you know, so I was forced to live this crazy life, uh, which didn't uh, feel normal at all. But then I noticed that whenever I'm abroad, I get to be in peace. And so I decided to move away so that I was able to, to write this book and to live a somewhat normal life. But yeah, this was all due to my investigations, which I had, I had started a couple of years earlier, but it, it was really horrible. And the worst thing really was to see my own friends turn into enemies. There are many different missions that these propaganda architects have and reasons why they do such disgusting operations against uh, Westerners, but of course also Russians. My case uh, was to stop me from writing these articles and to create this feeling of fear, which indeed I'm feeling, and then act on that fear, fear and stop reporting about Russia issues. And also then to marginalize me in public sphere so that no one would believe when I would give interviews and give lectures about Russian trolls. And it did succeed to a certain degree because so many people still think that Jessica Aro is this lunatic pro-NATO troll herself uh, who is um, only just making stuff up and Russian trolls don't really exist. Seriously, there are now certain uh, amount of people who still believe that Russian trolls only exist in my imagination. So this is the uh, basic concept of uh, Russian information operations and attacks against individuals. They try to destroy the credibility. As I started to monitor the Russian trolls and social media propagandist activities, uh, mostly first on Facebook, on Twitter, as well as on YouTube, I realized that there are so many different ways how these trolls are exploiting these channels and how these channels definitely aren't and weren't at that time doing basically anything to stop them. Uh, let me give you just some examples. These trolls were building groups on Facebook in which the only aim was to spread Russian state propaganda as well as attack individuals who were investigating Russia, who were just doing their job, so journalists and researchers and such. And seriously, there was a network of such groups on Facebook, not just in Finnish language, but also in other languages, for example, in Swedish, as well as many others. Uh, when me and my friends started to report these groups, because they incited hatred, they were spreading hate speech, uh, they were committing crimes. When we reported those groups to Facebook, Facebook just told that they were not breaking any community standards. So basically did nothing. And you know, even later on, as I realized, as many others also started to realize that these trolls are seriously being used also to attack, for example, the US presidential elections 2016. And I realized that they are not just a threat to freedom of speech, but also a threat to national security of different countries. Then uh, I also tried to warn Facebook and other social media companies not to enable these uh, trolls and Russian security structures and propagandists. But unfortunately, uh, these companies are really good at giving nice speeches in different conferences, claiming that they protect vulnerable communities and such, but when in fact they do nothing or nearly not enough. And now we have seen with uh, Putin's accelerated warfare against Ukraine, only then we saw YouTube as well as Facebook demonetizing some of these Russian state uh, media uh, channels from their 
own platforms. And there we can see uh, why they have let them operate so long, because they provide profit to these companies. The social media companies are themselves heavily lobbying uh, in order to provide themselves the maximum uh, freedoms and maximum rights. So uh, we need to be really aware that these companies are trying to bend our own legislation and to uh, take it to the direction that is beneficial only to these companies and not to our citizens. So what I have kindly recommended and I still do would be to uh, make these companies uh, obey their own community standards, uh, which are often in line with uh, local legislations. Uh, so, uh, for example, that they would not allow uh, very basic forms of uh, criminal activity, for example, uh, libels or stalking, as well as spreading hate speech. So to start from there, and the European Commission has even tried uh, to um, have those companies take down uh, hate speech, but still it exists. If we if we skip World War One because it's very complicated, World War Two, which is you know this is the birth of the great soviet myth and really world war ii for the second half of the 20th century and the second half of the soviet period was the defining narrative for the soviet government they turned it into something where it looked like communism would no longer bring utopia nobody was really persuaded of this after the experiences of the 1930s and the 1940s nobody nobody thought that this great marxist utopia was ever going to happen but the war which seems strange given that 25 million Soviets died and there was once again a recurring theme in Russian wars, a great amount of incompetence by the Russian generals at the front led to a lot of the sacrifice. The war was always heralded as this moment where sacrifice brought something new, made new worlds possible and once again announced Russia as a great power and a great nation. Basically, there were a series of founding moments that the Soviets tried to use to justify what they were doing, what they were doing, and to promise that the future was always about to come. The October Revolution, of course, was one of the big ones. And then the Civil War, where yes, we were fighting the whites, but the whites were somehow anti-Soviet and therefore anti-Russian, because the two the two terms very quickly in the Soviet Union became pretty synonymous to be a good Soviet and to be the best Soviet meant to be Russian. And so it was widely propagandized in many, many very tedious 1920s and 1930s books and movies, always with this spirit of sort of sacrificial heroism. And what's interesting actually is from the, just the things I've pointed out so far is that Russia constantly finds itself having to re-promise to the public re-promise to the nation that we're starting again. This is the big moment, right? This is the foundation. It's gonna be, you know, Peter the Great. It's gonna be 1812. It's going to be Crimea. This is the time when we're gonna fix it. No, now it's 1917. Now it's the Civil War. Now it's the Second World War. The future is always just, you know, just, just a few months or a few years away. And it's always just sort of chasing away from you. And it's, it's one of the interesting things that I think we ought to be thinking about today as we interpret or as we seek to interpret what Russians are making of the war in Ukraine, which seems to be going really badly. You know, I'm not a battlefield expert and I can't tell you who's going to win the war, but things don't look like they're going to plan, right? I think we can all agree, agree on that. Epic defeat often leads to these sorts of epic renewals, right? Even if in reality, it's not true that that happens. It doesn't matter because the myths of these wars will be presented as such and shaped as such to make it feel that way. And I find it really unlikely that this sort of war will be widely dismissed or forgotten or somehow become a point of embarrassment or humiliation for Russians unless things become really mind-bogglingly disastrous for them, unless there's a complete military collapse and perhaps an economic and political collapse to go with it. And I'm not sure of the whether that will happen, but it's, again, 
seems unlikely right now. The victors write history, we know that. But what kind of a history they write and the ways in which that history is embodied in movies and culture and daily life is what really interests me about the way that Russians do this. Because I think like no other European nation, and I know it's controversial for those of you who are paying attention to call Russia a European nation, it's a shorthand, don't, don't attack me in the comments. I can't think of another European nation that has war quite so deeply embedded in its national self-conception as Russia does. And in particular, a series of wars that have basically been pretty disastrous. And I think one of the big positives uh, post February 24th, in terms of the reaction to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, has been the unity that we've seen in the EU and NATO. Uh, and, you know, that's presented a very united front. I think Putin didn't expect that. No one expected uh, the number of Russian banks that have been, would have been kicked off from SWIFT. No one expected uh, CBR assets to be sanctioned. That was quite extraordinary, right? And I, I remember at the time that. You know, on the Tuesday of the, that week, um, I, th I heard the I, I read the first article suggesting it would be a good idea, and I still didn't really think it would happen. But on the Saturday morning, I was getting calls from Washington asking me, "What do I think about this?" And it was done on the Sunday. Utterly, utterly remarkable, and 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 that I think really shocked the Russians. They didn't think the, the U.S. and its allies would do that. Uh, we all made mistakes in our our handling and management of Russia, right? I mean. We were too open uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. On we gave Putin the benefit of the doubt when he took power in 1999 and assumed the presidency in 2000. Uh, we didn't look uh, enough at his CV, I think. Which uh, and then his subsequent actions, right? And and you know you could you know there's a lot of focus actually on on uh, the debate about energy sanctions and and policy mistakes were made. In the end. You know, Germany, Austria, Central European countries, who were the big appeasers in terms of the relationship with Russia, uh, made bad choices, right? They, they thought that appeasement and an engagement with Russia would ultimately moderate Putin and Russia's behavior. And it didn't, right? And they, they thought that business was the way to, to kind of moderate his, his actions. And in then they just became uber dependent on Russian energy. And the city of London, the UK, was too open to Russian capital. You know, a lot of focus on London Grab, the London London Grab, the London laundromat. Um, you know, we I think I think we're realizing that um, you know uh, Russia and and its uh, the FSB and, and Putin's agents, you know, corrupted our Western systems from within. Right? We were too e eager to accept Russian money, Russian financing, academia business, the city, uh, real estate agents, uh, the law, you know, we, we uh, and politicians also, I mean, there's obviously lots of focus on that, you know, 100,000 pound tennis matches, uh, peerages for, 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 for various Russians, uh, you know, we, we, none of us come out particularly well out of this, uh, I have to say, and, and, and some of us, like myself, people at Chatham House were warning and, uh, about this for many years, and, and we were kind of uh, dismissed as uh, as Cold War warriors, but I think the reality is that you know Russia didn't change very much after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and and Putin didn't in particular. At the moment, there seems to be this craze that you know blaming the West, blaming NATO uh, for this intervention in Ukraine. I mean, the, the fault is with Putin, right? Uh, it, you know, the West, uh, understandably, you know countries with history with Russia, you know, the Balts, Poland, uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, all these countries, you know, they wanted to join NATO because they were worried about the threat from Russia and then they were right, right? And, and, uh, and uh, you know, NATO, I, I, I've written and, you know, argued extensively, you know, in the end, this, this war was not about NATO enlargement. This, this was, uh, you know, NATO, Ukraine, if you go back to 2014, uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea, and then its intervention in Donbass in 2014-15. Uh, at that point in time, Ukraine had no aspirations to join NATO. If you look at the, well, 
the, you know, there was talk about it, but the opinion polls show very low support, single digit support for NATO membership in Ukraine at that time, because Ukrainians kind of, you know, we're, we're worried about what it might mean in terms of relationship with Russia. You know, this, they had a non-aligned status. Uh, that changed because of Russian annexation of Crimea and its incident in Donbass. Suddenly the Ukrainians thought our non-aligned status didn't really get us anywhere. Uh, we, we, maybe it's not a bad idea to join NATO, but even then NATO was very reluctant to, to let Ukraine in because it was worried about the Russian reaction. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was not about NATO, it was about Putin's views about Ukraine. A, a very strong case can be made against Russia for war crimes and even genocide against mm. Ukraine by Russia. Um, I think there's hubris is the big word, ineptitude, um, overconfidence, um, hanging on to their history from the Second World War, because their campaigns since then have been minor, uh, where they've had overwhelming financial and military power over the small enemies that they've, um, they've managed to defeat in Chechnya, in Syria, and so on. So... Um, their staff college clearly failed to improve and modernize um, their general staff systems as the world developed, uh, thinking that they could simply overwhelm people with numbers. And they failed to do that, and they're still failing to do that in many ways. Their armed forces cannot be mobilized because they're not technically, as far as they're concerned, at war. They've got a special military operation. They can only pull up their uh, reserves if they declare that their country is at risk. The existential um, situation with Russia is at risk, which it isn't because they're invading another country. So they're limited in the number of troops they have available. Their troops are not motivated because they know they're invading a foreign country and they don't want to actually they don't want to actually be there. So they've got no. They've got, they haven't got great morale and they've taken high casualties. Now, at the moment in the East, they're on the offensive. But the thing about an army on the offensive is it's going to take far more casualties than the army on the defensive. So they have to put a huge amount of energy into taking a small amount of ground. The Ukrainians withdraw into new defensive positions and force them to go through it all over again. Now, that's something that can be done. If you have reserves that can come in and you can keep replacing the losses, but they don't really have that many troops to keep replacing the losses. So it's going to be it's proving hugely expensive for Russia. Can they keep it going? They're going to get exhausted. Their, log their, their logistical supplies are going to run out. Can the Ukrainians uh, manage to keep on fighting as well? Will they get exhausted? Will it come to some kind of stalemate? An awful lot of the conscripts are not people from the major cities in Russia. Um, a lot of the young, more highly educated, better traveled young people in the major cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg and so on. Those young people are questioning this straight away and saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be involved with this. I am not going. Um, once you get out of uh, Moscow, you get across the Urals and into the into Siberia then you can start to persuade people that it's the right thing to do for Mother Russia. And they're going to go. They're not high, necessarily highly educated, not linked to the Internet, not subject to international opinions. So they're the people that are turning up. Um, but they only have to be in the front line for a few weeks to discover how expendable they are and to listen to the more experienced troops uh, to, for their morale to go downhill. All armed forces have um, a police capacity to try to stop people deserting, uh, running away and breaches of discipline, low morale, etc. The myth of their invincibility and their size and their power has been blown away by the um, defensive abilities of little Ukraine. And um, it's been a shock. But that defence has been enhanced by the high tech um, shoulder fired. Um, and uh, anti-aircraft weapons and systems that Ukraine spent the last 20 years bringing into their own armed forces, plus the fact 
that they had training from Canada, USA, UK, Israel to bring their armed forces up to date so that soldiers could use their own initiative, junior officers could use their own initiative in the battlefield. And this allowed them to mount um, insurgency uh, campaigns uh, on the Russian flanks when they advanced towards Kyiv. So it's, um, yeah, the, they've done extraordinarily well already and they have a lot to be proud of, the Ukrainians. But um, are we going to continue to support them? If the West continues to supply the treasure and the weapons, then I think they can actually uh, turn Russia around and send them back. The core problem was that there was no rule of law after the break after the breakup of the Soviet Union. You had you had a situation in which the entire economic system was going to be changed from a system of state ownership to a system of private ownership. And uh, it was done without any kind of moral rules. And this was a legacy of Russian of ideology, of Soviet ideology, I should say. The, the notion that what counts is the economic system and that law, morals, ethics, culture are all derivative. So uh, therefore, the the even though the the young reformers considered themselves radical communists, they operated within a uh, kind of communist uh, or you know Marx Marxist intellectual framework, uh, and their view was you know, all we had to do was change ownership. Well, they did. They took a, a ownership out of the hands of the state and put it in in the hands of you know assets in the, and and factories and enterprises in the hands of private people but the, the, this massive process which it was probably the largest peaceful transfer of power of property i'm sorry uh in in world history uh was accomplished without the benefit of law and as a result what you got was gangsterism now who how do you defend gangsterism you know in a situation which still uh has at least formal elections uh well, you, with the use of provocation and terror, who is capable of employing provocation and terror? Well, the former security services, now renamed. Uh, and once they've uh, terror has been used uh, to solidify the hold on power of a criminal group, which is basically what happened, uh, <clears throat> then uh, uh, it's unrealistic to think that th those who you who use terror uh, will, will uh, in order to seize power, will ever give it up, and and they they won't. People accept a set of of uh, uh, propositions uncritically, uh, and then apply them to every political situation. I, this is uh, simplifies the world and it relieves people of the ob ob obligation to think. In fact, it's actually quite a temptation because once you know, and this was very comp this was very very obvious in the Soviet Union uh, that the, the the Soviet ideology broken down to a few simple to understand precepts relieved millions of people of the obligation to think for themselves. And at the same time, it in, in, engendered a certain feeling of superiority, paradoxical as that may be. Uh, Soviet citizens were very happy. They had the answers to every question. They had a formula that could, that could be a, applied to anything, whether it was art, music, literature, politics, uh, and uh, and they could be uh, they could be assured that at least in the eyes of of their country and their and their regime, uh, you know they were absolutely correct. Political correctness, which of course now is also an issue in the West, I mean it got its start that way. The idea that some things are are simply correct in and of themselves without reference to higher moral or intellectual authority or to a you know to a, a serious reasoning process you establish a situation for yourself in which uh 
your identity is tied in an unhealthy way uh, to a view of the world, which is artificial. Uh, and therefore, you're not, you know, this is a big mistake that Westerners sometimes make, assuming that if Russians knew the truth, that they would immediately throw over uh, uh so, you know so, some of their ideas including support for the war against ukraine it's not necessarily true in fact it isn't true because the you know, the i for ideas to have an effect there has to be receptivity to those ideas and uh, there's not going to be receptivity if the 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 set of views that a person uh has adopted and uh, made a matter of personal identity uh are uh, perfectly satisfactory for him. He uh, He's not going to welcome anything that upsets his mental equilibrium or forces him to think. We, we pay a price for, I mean, what communism did, if we go back to the question of communism, what, 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 it, what it did and what it sought to do was to, to abolish objective standards. There was the concept of class values. In other words, uh, all values were determined by the interests of the most pro progressive class. If something was in the interest of the working class, this is Marxism, like classic Marxism, Lenin is, is expressed by Lenin in his speech to the Komsomol in 1919. Uh, if something is in the interest of the working class, then it's, it's moral uh, by definition, because there's no higher... Sort of, there's no higher goal for society than the revolution and the and the uh, uh, the rule of the working class. So anything that advances that, even a terrible crime, is actually a moral act. Well, the effect of that was to destroy, and not just in the Soviet Union but worldwide, the idea of objective standards that there's something that is right or wrong, true or false, irrespective of the political context. It's amazing how many of the, the blunders and the just sheer inhuman treatment of their own people that we saw back then in late Soviet times that are that is being repeated now, you know, many years later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have to treat that particular document with some caution. But still, look, even you know, even if it's just thirty-five thousand dead, even if it's more than fifty thousand dead, I mean, in, in, in either way, not only is is that kind of a horrific statistic, mm. but you're absolutely right to just simply brush that off as being well, no, no real issue of concern. I think demonstrates that degree to which sort of Putin has internalized this notion of l'état c'est moi, that essentially you know he is the state, and so long as it's good for the state and for him, then any cost is acceptable. Before he went into the KGB, Putin was some wide-eyed innocent mm. or naive yeah. idealist. Quite the opposite. I mean, this is you know, we we know even from his rather disreputable childhood. You know, basically, you know, he he ran with street gangs. He got involved in fights and such like. And it seems to be that he joined the KGB not because he wanted to be the sword and shield of the Communist Party, mm. but because it was basically the biggest gang in town. And I think this is the problem. I mean, a lot of the people who joined the KGB did so precisely because they reckoned it was a good way to, you know, basically make money, gain power, and essentially sort of work your way into um, the sort of what we would think of almost as a sort of the social elite if you happen to be, you know, born as an outsider. Mm. Um, so yes, I mean, you know, they're, they're very different people, but I think in some ways what it was was, was Putin's experiences first in the KGB, and then as the kind of, I don't know, fixer, I suppose one would put it, in the 1990s for the, the, the Leningrad and St. Petersburg mayor's office, sort of dealing with all kinds of disreputable business people, gangsters and the like. I think what that did was hone those characteristics that were there. I think that, I mean, you're right that his instinct is to escalate, uh, because for him, this is an existential struggle. It's not simply about Russia, it's about his own political future. You know, he really has staked his his position, but also his place in history on the success of this particular gambit in, in, in Ukraine. And it's clearly going disastrously wrong. I mean, I think that said, we should also realize that in his own terms, Putin is a deeply unpleasant, but nonetheless rational actor. 
you know, some people say, oh, he's mad, he's a sociopath or whatever. Well, for me, these are these are almost cop out. Um, just, they're more or less saying this is why we can't possibly try and predict what he is because what he's going to do because of, of this. No, I mean, as we saw with his very first drive to try and seize Kiev. I mean, yeah, clearly this, this was a serious operation. We, we had the flower of Russian special forces pretty much decimated there. Major military convoy sent and such like. It didn't work. He could have chosen to escalate, but instead he realized, no, this isn't going to be sort of a, the pushover that I thought. I'll pull back, reformulate a strategy and focus instead on the Donbass and the, the Southeast. So, you know, this is a man who, when, when he sees alternatives, he will actually sort of rationally work it out. But yeah, he will be thinking, how, how can I push the situation to my advantage? I mean, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen on, on the battlefield. He doesn't really have much scope to, to escalate in conventional military terms. He doesn't have any scope to escalate in terms of the economic war with the West. And although people sometimes talk about the risks that he might turn to sort of tactical nuclear weapons or the like, I, I see no signs that the Russians are contemplating that. I think they realize that that would be a real game changer. That's the kind of thing that would stop the West from just simply thinking mm. as this as being something about helping Ukraine win mm. and getting the West to start thinking seriously about regime change. The Chinese would be very worried and unhappy with that. I mean, they're still not particularly happy with this war as is, especially mm. because they have huge investments in Ukraine. But but yes, I mean, so for, for all those reasons, really all Putin can do now is dig in. I mean, from his point of view, and again, this is what came out of his very bullish comments uh, recently in, in Vladivostok, where he was saying, look, Western sanctions you know, are entirely pointless and meaningless. They're doing no harm at all. They're actually making Russia stronger and so forth. Obviously, that is nonsense. Sanctions are having a serious impact, but they're a long term. They're a slow burn weapon to be used. But his hope is not just to kind of rally the troops at home, but is also to try and shake the unity and the conviction in the West. Because the thing that would be most devastating to Ukraine is actually if the West decided to scale down its support. Its support, obviously, militarily on the battlefield, but also, essentially, the Ukrainian economy is on life support and is being kept afloat precisely by, by Western financial assistance. So, you know, I think from Putin's point of view, he's hoping that a hard winter gets Europeans in particular thinking, oh, is this really worth it? We've already seen big protests, for example, in Prague. Mm. And that is what might give him some kind of a victory. What they can do is kind of work with the grain. I, th I think in some ways that we should think of them almost as radicalizing forces. That they, What they can do is take people who are disgruntled, a little bit disgruntled, and make them angrier. Mm. But I think the thing is that actually, I think you know, particularly these kind of scale of protests and some of the other protests that we've seen in Germany and elsewhere, I think that, I mean, they reflect a sense that Ukraine is a long way away. And why are we suffering? And you know, there is a sort of, I think, a quite, quite a pervasive mood that says, look, after COVID and everything else, we, you know, we, we were looking forward to the rebound. Mm. And now not only are we having to pay ridiculously high energy prices and so forth, but we're also seeing huge amounts of money being being sent to Ukraine. And it's not that they have anything against Ukraine. And it's certainly not that they have anything against Russia uh, in favor of Russia. Mm. I mean, you know, the Czechs have all kinds of bad blood of their own with the Russians. Just they are unhappy with the fact that money is being spent there, not at home. We have to realize that there's a key difference between what happened in these regions and what happened in Crimea. Mm -hmm. you know, Crimea was clearly, you know, Putin himself said, you know, he basically told his guys, OK, time to take back Crimea and a major multifaceted operation that involved everything from special forces to subversion to military intelligence to criminality and so forth was deployed for that purpose. And originally that was going to be the end of it. It was just about taking back the Crimean Peninsula that on the one hand was strategically vital to the Russians because it was the where the Black Sea fleet was based. But also an area that you know, pretty much every Russian regards as rightfully Russian. It, it was until the 1950s, part of the Russian Federation. I remember I, I was in, I was living in Moscow in uh, 2014 when the, sort of the vote on annexation was held and scarcely got a, a wink of sleep that night because mm. I was living on one of the big ring roads. And you know, all night long, people were driving round and round the ring roads blowing their horns, waving flags, cheering and so forth. You know, it's a real point. And, you know, and this, as I said, it includes people who were deeply opposed to Putin. 
the what the Russian Federation is doing um, is a violation of international law, uh, using force to change borders, uh, sham referenda, illegal annexation, murder of innocent civilians, uh, targeting civilian areas with very expensive precision munitions. These are not accidents. Uh, and then, of course, uh, causing disruption and uh, life-threatening circumstances for millions of people because of blocking the shipment of grain and energy. So all of these things are, are part of the uh, Russian way of war, not to mention undermining democracies uh, around the world through malign influence and uh, and money and, and other other uh, means. So that's that's what this is about. Nobody's saying that Ukraine is perfect or that Europe is perfect or that the United States is perfect. But in terms of the moral circumstances of this conflict, which I think has been going on for about 30 years, actually, starting with this breakaway of Transnistria, then invasion of Georgia, then invasion of Crimea, support for Assad, and now what started in February. It's a, it's a new 30 years war. While he has made several uh, fatal strategic mistakes that are that are going to lead to the collapse of, I believe, the Russian Federation here in the coming years, and certainly their defeat on the battlefield, he was smart enough to recognize years ago that um, the West would be very, very slow to act decisively to what he was doing. And mm. I think the uh, they calculated that the West would not stick together, uh, that we would not really support Ukraine, which is, I think, part of why he went ahead back in February, feeling confident that, mm. that he could get away with what he had been doing in previous years. This argument somehow that this is really the fault of the West and, you know, that we lied to the after the breakup of the Soviet Union and um, that NATO is encircling Russia is a total farce. And, and it's any serious person can see that. I mean, the, the question is, why do all the nations that used to be Soviet republics or under the Warsaw Pact, why did they go scrambling to join NATO and the EU as fast as they could? Mm. Because they know what it's like to be a part of the Russian empire, whatever the name is. It's, it's about being a part of the Russian empire. None of them wanted that. So NATO offered that. So the idea that somehow NATO is expanding is is a completely wrong way to describe it. And and the safest part of Russia was always the part that touched NATO. That was the one place where they could be sure from which they would never be invaded. Estonia, Latvia, mm -hmm. they're never going to invade Russia. And and now because of what uh, President Putin has initiated, the amount of NATO that touches his border is doubling. I think the Ukrainians have achieved. Uh, irreversible momentum. Of course, it's too early to be um, uh, planning victory parades, and, and this is going to go on for some time. But my sense is that so long as we, the U.S., the U.K., uh, and other allies and partners who have been supporting Ukraine, as long as we stick together, keep sanctions in place, continue to deliver what we said we're going to deliver, then I think uh, Ukrainian forces are going to push the Russians back to the 23 February line by the end of this year, mm. and that by the middle of next year that they will be in Crimea. Of course, I, I'm going out on a limb here to predict how something as uncertain, uh, with so much fog and friction as is the nature of war, uh, but I, I feel confident in, in making my assessment because we know from history that war is a test of will and it's a test of logistics. And the Russian logistical system is exhausted uh, and it's going to get worse as Ukrainians continue to pound like they're doing now. Um, ammunition storage sites, headquarters, as they continue to capture uh, critical rail junctions like Lyman, which they apparently are, are doing as we speak. Um, so uh, and then when you add however many number of new newly mobilized troops show up, if it's one, two, three hundred thousand or more. Mm. That, that's that's added burden on the logistical system, which is already exhausted. So um, I think for that reason alone, and, and because of sanctions prevent the Russians from replacing all of their precision weapons, 
they're under enormous stress. But but how does that get to Crimea? I think this counteroffensive that started back at the beginning of the month, uh, you know, we we focused on Harrison, then we focused on the the part that came down through uh, Kharkiv and is uh, and now has resulted in the capture apparently of Lyman. This is all one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's one counteroffensive with different components, and the Ukrainian general staff has impressed me with first of all their their knowledge and skill of employing operational art, um, but also they they seem to be agile enough to exploit opportunities as they as weaknesses are discovered and so on. Um, they're being methodical in Kherson. There's no need to rush there to get into a bloody battle that would destroy the city. It's a Ukrainian mm -hmm. city. Uh, but you do have several thousand Russian troops that are trapped there. So these things are all converging towards Crimea. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think of it, on my imaginary air map here, I'm using my hands you know, from Harrison and then coming down, they will soon have HIMARS uh, and other long-range rocket systems like the ones that UK has provided and Germany has provided um, that will be able to reach Russian bases in Crimea. Mm. And once that happens, then I think it's a matter of time that, that Crimea becomes untenable for um, for Russian forces. So ironically, uh, they're still in the same building. Uh, these are still the same people. Uh, all of them were working for KGB, you know, all their lives. Uh, Putin spent in KGB 20 years prior to the prior to the period when he became a politician and then president of Russia. But, uh, you know, these are people who are trained by KGB. Uh, they, these are people who were selected for KGB initially. And uh, they're really very different from the rest of us. That's why we have difficulties to understand what they are, what their intentions are. That's why it's very easy for them to deceive us because when they talk to us, uh, and then this relates to Putin uh, talking to head of states, for example, they're not really talking to us, they are recruiting us. That's why it's very important for Putin to understand uh, every time he is with somebody how to uh, you know recruit this person, how to make it the way that his opponent uh, will like him. And uh, you know they are very good in finding weaknesses. If if you are a liberal, Putin will be liberal with you. If you are a nationalist, he would become nationalist with you. Uh, if you are fascist, he will be fascist with you. And if you are communist, uh, he will be communist with you. And that's why he creates uh, impression that uh, you know he is like everybody's. Uh, Friend. And until, until of course, uh, well, 2014 came first, and then 2022 came, until this was not about friendship or being liked anymore, or pretending that uh, you are a Democrat or a liberal anymore, uh, until they started to implement their political program. Now, the political program, and this is very important, has its roots in the idea of the world communism. And of course, in December of 1917, when the, the first state security, the VCK was created, uh, those people were well, mainly communists and they believed in communism. And uh, again, the idea was to have world revolution. Uh, so it's the same idea to take control over the world. Well, starting with Europe, to be fair, right? There is a difference, of course, the uh, communist party, uh, you know, was in charge of the state and in charge of the state security, known mainly those years as uh, KGB. And uh, as we know, the Communist Party failed. And in 91, the Soviet Union, you know, was dissolved and disappeared from the map. But from the point of view of KGB, the only reason why communists failed, because they were limited in the moves by this 
communist ideology. And that's why uh, the, the idea of KGB was to survive what they did. This was the only structure which survived the collapse of the Soviet Union in 91. Everything else was dead. Uh, to survive and to continue their activity without political control, without any political control. And then they succeeded in 2000. And historically speaking, this is a very short period of time from 91 to 2000. But in nine years, they were in charge of a major world power, uh, not forgetting the fact, major nuclear world power, and they were ruling this country without, since 2000, when Putin became president, uh, without any political control. They are above everything. Uh, the political parties in Russia basically do not exist. They exist, but they do not fight for power. Uh, the army is uh, under control of the state security. It's a, it's a frightening picture because there is this never happened in the world, never happened, uh, when a state security would run a country. Uh, we were dealing with uh, dictators, monarchs, political parties, hunters, but state security never ran the country. This, this is the first experience, uh, and I have to say that the experience happened to be a very frightening one, because those people were for generations, those people were trained to destroy and to kill. They were never trained to build and to create. Oh, we, um, Ukraine, and like, um, I, I really equate ourselves to the rest of uh, like Europe, for example. We are not that different. And, um, you know, we were living in this normal world. And we believe that after we gained independence in 1991, we can slowly develop into a better country, more democratic country, reform ourselves. And we were moving in that direction with some pros and cons with some revolutions, but I'm really proud that we have a very active uh, civil society. Um, I like repeating that in my videos too. If you don't trust like some of Ukrainian politicians, if you believe that we have inherited corruption from Russia and from the USSR, we did to a certain extent, but at the same time, we have a super uh, active and super good uh, civil society that when it feels that something goes really wrong in Ukraine, uh, these people always react. So we have that percentage, I don't know, that is enough to make some important changes in your country. And uh, we were developing like normally, and uh, we wanted this evolution to go smoothly. Of course, there are lots of mistakes that we did, like we were not uh, prepared for this war 100% because of our normalcy bias, we thought, Things like that are impossible in the 21st century, in the center of Europe, with no reason. Also, we believed like uh, like we were hidden behind the Iron Cotton for so many years. And uh, to some extent, we are less like diverse than many other European societies because once again, we were closed and not many people traveled, not that many, like, I don't know, marriages between different cultures, mixed families and so on. And uh, many people did not know much about us, and we did not work hard enough to, I don't know, open Ukraine to the world. But we all believed we still have time, like it will come in five years. And it did come, for example, working at the university, I can compare myself as a student, and we had like three, four opportunities to go abroad during my whole university time and now students have five seven during a, like a semester and many of them travel and like in every group I will have Erasmus students I will have some other programs and it's not like something extraordinary in my time it was like wow you've been to like Germany elsewhere and here so things changed naturally in a good way but now this war boosted attention to Ukraine to some extent, we always wanted to go out of these shadows of the Iron Curtain of the USSR and to tell the world, no, we're not Russia. We are very different from Russia, as you see. We were occupied. We were hidden, muted. And that is a very uh, 
violent authoritarian regime and still we managed to survive to preserve our language our cultural identity and we did not become haters you know sometimes i am very much surprised at like we've been uh occupied by russian empire and parts of ukraine for such a long period of time and we've been uh occupied by soviet union and that were centuries when they were sharing with that gloomy reality with us and still we did not uh, get infected with this like uh, a typical ukrainian does not want to feel like miserable and there are some bad qualities of our national character like every nation has and i'm not like i am realistic about that and but at the same time there are some internal mechanisms that we believe like suffering is not good. Sometimes you have to, sometimes you are wrong, uh, born in a uh, wrong period of time. Or here in Ukraine, we have a joke like, can I please live a normal life, but not in a history book? I don't want to live this historical period. <laughs> I want to live like in a boring ordinary. <laughs> but we understand, and I think this is what I do not like to say the West, because this is like a Russian idea, like, uh, if we look at it from the Russian perspective, uh, the West shares with the world some good qualities, like, if it is possible, try to live a better life, if it is possible, try to get your education, if it is possible, try to travel more, uh, or like, buy yourself a house, try but like you're sharing things that actually bring pleasure, may bring normality. Maybe you won't be, you won't have this opportunity, but the standard, the things you are uh, craving for, they are good. And uh, in uh, Russia, uh, this kind of like, why do you want to live uh, normal? Why do you want to eat normal? It's not like... Mm, I don't know if maybe it came with this proletariat in Soviet Union or something that um, uh, if you want to live good, if you want to be like normally rich, like it's normal to want, like not to become an oligarch, but to, I don't know, to good to have a good car or to travel or like to buy expensive food. It's good. It's not bad. And they have this like, no, you want to want to live this good life. You want, yes. And uh, they share that in uh, their societies. And um, I remember reading some uh, stories like when people were afraid in Soviet schools to dress up because they will be mocked, like you're looking too good. And somehow they really uh, think that uh, sacrifice, misery, are the things that uh, you have to go through in your life. And if you are living a better life, you have to pay for it because it's not honest, it's not good. Like you have, and that's what Ukraine actually is doing now in their perspective. They think like, I, I, I do believe that they see pretty well that our life is better than theirs both in um, this material perspective because they loot sneakers and t-shirts like and Nutella and also because uh, like of that kind of freedom we honestly have jokes about our presidents and we speak them on the streets and in pubs and uh, we have visa-free regime and other things and they want to punish us for this like living a uh, normal life and not enjoying uh, misery so Key moment is the start of the war and it's right to say that nothing is inevitable but nevertheless we have to look at the thinking that led up to um, this war and analyze a little bit and i think it's possibly helpful to think about two connected directions one is regime security you know what does this war have to do with securing putin's stay in power and really secu securing the russian political system that is sort of um simply based around putin's personality now and then there was a set of partly real partly quasi mystical thoughts about engaging in a confrontation with the West, 
by taking a set of provocative and they hoped dizzyingly successful steps, putting the West on the back foot and waiting for that maneuver to accelerate an already ongoing and inevitable decline that Mr. Putin has with a great deal of exaggeration diagnosed us with here in the West. So the regime security bit is that there is a defensive war story here for Putin, which simply goes like this. An independent and democratic Ukraine, forget any alliance memberships, just an independent and democratic Ukraine is an existential threat to him, to me, Mr. Putin, particularly at the time that a moment of instability comes along. Having a country and a culture relatively close, demonstrating that the modern Democratic Republic is a viable model in the ex-Soviet space, you know, would be very, very dangerous. And you, the last thing Putin would want is a kind of uh, platform in the form of Ukraine that would potentially tilt the balance of power at a moment of his regime being in crisis. And the image that he associates with this is probably the death of Gaddafi, to some extent, the death of Saddam. So the defensive element, the regime security element here is that in Putin's mind, and I don't think this is a game, he at least half believes this and probably more than half, independent Ukraine poses a threat to his regime and his stay in power. It poses a threat to life for him and in some less transparent way poses a threat to Russian civilization that for him sort of incarnates in the will of a single individual, which is him. And over time, we've reached a situation where Mr. Putin is isolated himself against an alliance with military resource and financial resource, even if it's being fed in drip form to Ukraine sometimes, that is endlessly um, more extensive than his own. And therefore, um, allowing for the stability of um, Western support for Ukraine, we can now say some of the worst case scenarios to look forward to in 2023 and 2024 are probably in the realm of a stalemate rather than a defeat for Ukraine. Many people around the world, and indeed in many societies, it seems that people think of morality as being something that ends when you run out of people who you know in your personal life. And so one of the interesting ways people who do ghastly things justify what they do, I'm not necessarily talking about political leaders, I'm talking about, for example, other kinds of political activities, political violence of a, of a terroristic or indeed of a free, freedom fighting kind, very often somebody will feel that they're indeed a very ethically decent person because they have several cousins. There's so many of them, it's hard to count, but they still really care for them. They still provide for them. They still are concerned that they're making an okay living. But when it comes to simply strangers or the needs of strangers or not doing destructive things to strangers, one's ethical response simply runs out of steam. And that's a very, very, very big problem, I think, that I'm afraid is global. And there's an Israeli philosopher called Avishai Margalit, um, who is now in his 80s. And he talks about these relations with people we know as being thick relations, and these relations with people who are strangers to us, even if they're fellow citizens, as being thin relations. And I do think that Russia has a special crisis, has had a special crisis with thin relations for a long time. And why that is, 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 is a very interesting conversation. But that says nothing about um, the thick relations. And, and if we look at Russia you could see extraordinary networks of family support, you know, um, cousins, uncles, um, 
uh, really carrying wide family networks that otherwise may have collapsed um, uh, during the extraordinarily turbulent economic times. But the bit about thin morality has been in um, spectacular and astonishing crisis in, in, in Russia. I actually think it's in crisis here for us too, but it's so much worse there that it's shocking to us. You know, in some respects, there's been an evolution and a hardening of Putin in that context as well. I mean, he certainly had views when he came in, as everybody does. There was a particular context in which he'd grown up in the uh, post World War II Soviet period, kind of the peak in many respects of uh, of Soviet power, joining the KGB in the 1970s at a time when one would have. Uh, you know, basically on all kinds of different indices have thought that the, the Soviet Union was performing pretty well. But it's really the kind of the height of the Cold War, and that definitely shapes his his viewpoints. And he also um, has been very much uh, shaped not just by his interpretations and his um, own lessons that he's taken from Russian history as it was taught in um, the Soviet educational system, but also from his own experience of the Soviet Union. It's very hard for Putin to think of Ukraine and any other uh, former Soviet Republic has not been part of Russia and the, the kind of the, the map, the geographic map of his own mind. He certainly thinks of uh, Russia as including Ukraine and Belarus in that kind of larger uh, prospect, perhaps not all of Central Asia and maybe the Caucasus, but it's certainly in his mental map of what it meant to him as somebody who thought himself as a Russian in a Soviet context going to uh, Ukraine, Crimea, traveling through Belarus, you know, for example, that Slavic world, a largely Russian speaking world. And as we've seen over the last several years, particularly since he returned to the presidency, having been prime minister, his gaze has become more and more focused and fixated on Ukraine. And when I say the hardening of these views, I actually think that COVID had a lot to do with this. A lot of other people are talking about this as well, but, you know, Vladimir Putin spent a good, period of COVID like all of us did and uh, under kind of um, house confinement. His house is a bit different from most of ours. I spent a lot of time in this little box that you can kind of see, you know, here, which is a kind of a small office on the edge of my house. Uh, he had um, offices in the Kremlin, at various statues out in, uh, you know, Valdai and uh, down on the Black Sea. But nonetheless, he was left in many respects to his own devices. The, the circle around him shrank. And he became much more focused on his view of the world and on his legacy. And I think that's kind of, you know, what you're really asking about here. Um, you know, it's because we fail to fully recognize, just as you point out there, the worldview and the perspective and where he and the people around him were coming from. Because so many Russians weren't coming from that vantage point either. I mean, all the people that everybody knows and interacted with, and we've all got Russian friends. And, you know, while some of them might have been, you know, somewhat interested in that history, they were really living real lives in the real world. And this is the tragedy and the catastrophe of all of this for Russia as well as for Ukraine and for all the rest of us, is that, you know, people like Putin and the people around Putin have pulled us all back into a different era and a different age. In many respects, it's not just the 20th century. And, you know, here we are again in another great power conflict, like Germany did, did twice over, World War One and World War Two. But we're also getting pulled back to the periods of the 19th century, thinking about the Crimean War of the 1850s, or even further back. I mean, Putin keeps dragging us back to earlier eras in kind of demands, you know, for Russia's primacy and dominance of a particular region. And, and we were kind of failing to address this. We didn't, we didn't, you know, kind of push back on it. We didn't try to counter it. Or we didn't try to think of other arrangements, you know, to kind of uh, bring Russia into a kind of a, a broader European uh, perspective and give them a stake. I mean, there were various different um, efforts made, but they weren't very consistent. And ultimately, they didn't really kind of factor this in. When people say, oh, Russia was provoked. No, Putin provoked himself. I mean, he got himself so worked up about this um, idea clearly and the people around him hmm. and there was always a kind of a testing you know when i was in the government and we would meet with senior russian officials they'd say what is ukraine to you we'd be like well what do you mean what is it to us you can you see this was a kind of our own misreading i mean you know various different levels i of course understood this but we kept trying to say look we don't want ukraine <laughs> it's not our sphere of influence we're not 
you know, trying to kind of carve the world up. But there was still a very strong perception in the group around Putin, which we never really try could could properly explain, um, you know, to them you know, how we were seeing things in a different light, because they kept still thinking that we also believed in geopolitics and spheres of influence because of course you know the united states invaded iraq the united states moved into afghanistan you know the united states would flex its muscle in other places as well but in terms of europe and europeans you know with the exception of turkey um moving into cyprus northern cyprus other european countries weren't going around you know basically annexing the territory of their neighbors i mean there was of course britain's fight with argentina over the falkland islands but Europe had got out of the business of sphere of influences, but Putin believes that the United States is still an occupying force in Europe. And so we, so we're kind of stuck in this, you know, clash of empires and a lot of the rest of the world believes this as well, to be honest. I mean, a lot of people who, you know, push back against this because of their view too, that the United States is still an occupying force in Europe and that, you know, Europe has no agency and other countries do not. And that, you know, NATO, is a is some kind of entity completely co controlled by the United States that expands out. But we actually can see in real time, if people are looking properly at this, that you know the United States doesn't control everything in NATO. Turkey is blocking the entry of Sweden and Finland and could possibly continue to do that indefinitely. And the United States can do very little about it. It's just that we're we're all kind of stuck in these old patterns of looking at things and you know, it's very hard to see otherwise. And honestly, I think for most of us, like you and I, who, you know, did start studying Russian and, you know, visiting uh, the Soviet Union, you know, back in the day and spent all of our time, as you have said as well, you know, at different points studying this, it's inconceivable also to be in this position. When, when Russia first invaded uh, Ukraine and annexed Crimea, I have noticed uh, the, that the coverage um, in the West did not quite measure up to the level of the threat that Russian propaganda was posing. I would see um, things as they were happening back there, uh, hearing from the original sources, listening to the television from both sides, Ukraine and Russia, and then I would watch the way RT that was at the time prominently present in the United States broadcasting on our television networks, the way they would portray these events was completely untrue and uh, full of propaganda, unchecked propaganda, and our media did not pay um, adequate attention to dispelling the lies and propaganda that they were piping straight into American households and um, actually doing it worldwide. They are broadcasting in multiple languages and are affecting multiple regions of the world. So when I saw how prevalent uh, the lies were in their reporting, I took it upon myself to start creating collections of debunked Russian lies just to um, make the English speaking world more familiar with uh, what's going on in Russia, how Russia knowingly lies about certain things, and giving examples that people could see for themselves what really happened versus the way they have been reporting it. And my collection kept growing and growing from dozens into hundreds. And then I started writing articles about it. And uh, the Daily Beast um, invited me to become a columnist for them, which I still do to this day. And things um, kept on going from there. And uh, following Russian propaganda, I could basically see where it was going straight from the mouth of the propagandists themselves, because they're not just broadcasting in a vacuum. They're being told specific angles, specific lines of propaganda that they're pushing, and there is a specific reason for it. For example, for the last nine years or so, they have been very actively dehumanizing Ukrainians, often referring to them as pigs, traitors, and um, basically preparing the population for what was to come. I think a lot of people had a problem perceiving this as being real. It seems so uh, cartoonish almost, where on my uh, YouTube channel, 
for the Russian media monitor, that's one of the comments that I get most often. People say, well, this is like James Bond villains. If you wrote it in the movie, you'd be told that it's too much, that it's unbelievable. And I think people just had this uh, mental block refusing to realize that in this day and age, something like this could really happen, that history would be repeating itself in the worst way when uh, probably many people thought that the days of these kinds of wars or genocidal uh, imperial aspirations were behind us and it's a startling rude awakening for many they fully realize what they're doing uh, both Simonyan and um, uh, Salaviov uh, speak English and they they watch obsessively watch uh, Western media to see how this is being covered and uh, also sometimes they will slip up and say things like well many people in Russia still don't understand what we're doing in Ukraine and sometimes with these things you can't understand why this was necessary but maybe decades later we will understand so this to me reveals that they fully realize that there is no way to explain or justify what they're doing so they're just trying to comfort people by telling them well you just don't understand it now later on you'll understand why why this was necessary and uh, Salaviov as well who throughout his career had uh, changed his position many times and uh, sort of goes whichever way the wind blows and and uh, is a uh, I think it's because there's no way to logically justify what they're doing that he has become so enamored with the idea of uh, using religion to justify it, which to him is basically any religion. Anybody that he could recruit or help recruit to go fight there, it's fine to him. And he's sitting in his uh, studio, a practicing Jew, chanting Allahu Akbar or um calling to the orthodox people or buddhists it doesn't matter to him as long as those bodies will go to the front and uh, fight for for putin which is basically what it's all about for putin's imperial ambitions